Super VHS, or SVHS for short, is an improved version of VHS, a tape-based home video format. When Super VHS was introduced in 1987, it was proclaimed to be a quantum leap in home video picture quality, providing dramatic improvement over contemporary home video formats. Super VHS was 60% more detailed than standard VHS, exceeding the parameters of broadcast television, but its pitiful color resolution remained unchanged. Large objects having uniform color, shot with diffuse lightning and soft focus, looked great. But busy shots with a lot of detail appeared coarse and rough, making the difference between standard VHS and Super VHS all but imperceptible. Big film studios didn't see the increase in quality significant enough to justify releasing movies in SVHS. To make matters worse, blank SVHS tapes were more expensive than regular VHS tapes, and SVHS recordings wouldn't play in standard VHS machines. Even the manufacturers conceded that the most likely segment where Super VHS could gain foothold would be camcorders. Since 1980s, VHS had an edge over other consumer camcording formats in that one could take a cassette from a compact VHS camcorder, put it into an adapter shaped as a full-size VHS cassette, and play it in a regular VHS machine. Sometime in the early 1990s, JVC introduced machines that would play Super VHS tape but wouldn't record. JVC called this neutered version of Super VHS SQPB. The Super VHS quasi-playback capability may have been introduced even before 1990, it just didn't have a cool marketing name. The multi-system multi-voltage AGW1, for example, supported television standards of USSR, which dissolved in 1991, and East Germany, which reunited with West Germany in 1990. But for the life of me, I cannot get why such a sophisticated machine would play Super VHS but not record. Super VHS was quickly accepted for shooting all kinds of amateur content from family vacation videos to adult movies. Shoulder mount Super VHS camcorders were advertised as professional equipment in publications that targeted amateur photographers and videographers. Super VHS was deployed to high schools, colleges, and public access TV stations as a lower cost alternative to professional video formats. Meanwhile, in a digital galaxy not so far away, a supernova exploded. The first viable digital video and audio compression standard, H261, was released in 1988. This pivotal event was followed by creation of MPEG Group. The organization improved upon H261, added missing features, provided reference implementation of the codec, and released it as MPEG-1 in 1991. In terms of quality, MPEG-1 was similar to early YouTube. 240 lines, up to 30 frames per second, progressive scan, and a measly 1.5 megabit bitrate, chosen so that it could be authored to the same media used for audio CDs. MPEG-1 was considered similar to VHS in quality, although some tests found that it was even comparable to Super VHS, at least for one specific category of imagery, and that it offered for the first time the advantages of digital recording in a familiar video format. While MPEG-1 was acceptable for movies, it didn't support interlaced video, it didn't have high frame rate capability, so it could not preserve live look of broadcast TV. With the release of MPEG-1 and successes in developing digital TV, it became clear that with continuous improvements in data transmission rates, compression schemes and computing power, the advantage of digital formats over analog would only increase. So it was no coincidence that JVC helped the MPEG task force to assess video quality of MPEG-1 in November 1989 at the research laboratories of JVC in Kuriyama. Two years later, MPEG met again at JVC Kuriyama Technical Center to perform subjective assessment of MPEG-2 using compression rates from 5 to 10 megabits per second for high-quality moving pictures. After MPEG-2 was finalized in 1994, it quickly became the darling of the industry, used in broadcast television, satellite television, pre-recorded home video, news gathering, and even in making big-budget movies. There is a lot of controversy about the fact that we're shooting this digitally. As far as I'm concerned, they should have been shooting digital cinema 20 years ago. Right now, we can shoot on high def, and 50 minutes after we shoot a 50-minute cassette, it's inside the computer. Clearly, Super VHS being an analog format offered too little too late. If anything, the place of VHS should have been taken by DVHS, 
a digital format that would reuse the same mechanics and media as VHS and would allow to record both standard and high definition video on a familiar looking cassette using MPEG-2 encoding. When JVC proposed DVHS in 1995, it was originally limited to dedicated tuner built-in recorders. An expensive machine that was tightly coupled with a satellite dish didn't find many takers. Belatedly, in 1999, JVC recruited Sony to position DVHS recorder as the most practical digital video recorder for home network that used the 1394 serial interface. DVHS was expected to vitalize the huge asset of VHS that has already been accumulated. But something went wrong with DVHS along the way. Was the new format too late to the party, just like Super VHS ADK before it? Were the machines too expensive? Whatever the reason, DVHS has been slow to gain consumer enthusiasm. The reignited war with Sony, who pushed DV format, didn't help. Sony envisioned two DV variants. Small was supposed to be used in camcorders, while full size was meant to be used in the next generation of home VCRs. Along the way, Sony, who by that time already owned Columbia Pictures, and Panasonic, who had a stake in MCA, became nervous about giving consumers quality that was too good and that would not degrade from one copy to another, like analog video. By the end of 1990s, large screen TVs, satellite television transmissions and advancement of HDTV created a demand for a machine that could record and play video with higher resolution than VHS. And apparently neither DVHS nor DV was the answer. The high definition TV is wider, four times crisper, and that's what HD TV looks like on normal TV. <laughs> HD TV is the biggest thing to happen to television since color. Does this mean I'm gonna have to shave four times a day? Well, I don't know. That's a really good picture, yeah. So, in a surprising turn of events, JVC and Mitsubishi, the only remaining manufacturers of Super VHS machines by that time, were joined by Sharp, Philips, Toshiba, Panasonic, Marantz, and even Sony to revive Super VHS, bringing to the market a fair amount of SVHS machines from $270 and all the way to $1200. In 1998, responding to demands of the customers who were drilling a type detection hole in VHS cassettes so that the VCR would accept them as SVHS tapes, JVC rolled out expansion technology that allowed recording SVHS video onto a cheaper standard VHS tape, although the quality would be lower compared to recording on a proper SVHS tape. Reportedly, new JVC machines were faster than a speeding bullet. But the Super VHS comeback was short-lived. In 1988, the thinking was that the public would be interested in a machine that would tape their favorite television programs in their absence for replay at home at their leisure. Obviously, that product has to include the convenient cassette. Well, turns out that most people didn't care about the convenient cassette. They didn't care about removable media in general, whether it were magnetic tape or optical disc. All they wanted was pause live TV and go to the bathroom. This realization, along with the increased capacity of hard disk drives, culminated in introduction of two tapeless digital video recorders by TiVo and Replay TV. Digital video recorders brought a revolution into people's homes. They allowed viewers, who missed the beginning of a show, to start watching it from the beginning immediately before it have ended. Viewers could also pause a live program and then restart it right where they left off. They could perform instant replay and then resume watching the rest of the program while it still was in progress. For those who used the VCR for time shifting, DVR offered a radically new way of watching TV, which linear medium like tape could not provide. DVRs rendered tape recorders obsolete overnight. The only segment where removable media was still important was the camcorder market, so JVC continued to manufacture Super VHS camcorders. Here is one, the GR-SX950, made in 2000. In conclusion, I can say that while Super VHS proved viable in amateur video production, it failed to capture pre-recorded movie market. The format was released at the time when analog video was quickly becoming obsolete. Super VHS failed to become a stopgap solution on the way from analog home video to digital. Pre-recorded DVDs topped VHS sales for the first time in 2001. However, only 25% of homes owned DVD players in 2001, and VHS remained the top rental configuration until mid-2003. The last VHS machine was produced in 2016 by Funai Electric. 
It was a combo unit with a standard VHS Hi-Fi deck and a DVD player. That is it. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.